Hey you guys, time for another movie retrospective. Now, normally Tom would be doing this uh, retrospective with me, but he didn't get around to seeing this movie. And after I saw it, I kind of figured it wasn't really his bag anyway. So I was kind of like, whatever, I'll just, you know, it, I had to get it recorded today. So I was like, whatever, fuck it. I'll just like uh, do it on my own. And so that's what we're gonna do. Hopefully that's not gonna be a problem for anybody, but you know, here we go. So 1932's Vampire, or Vampire, if you want to pronounce it like all fucking fancy and European, it's one of those movies that I always felt like I needed to get around to seeing as it's one that often turns up on lists of like most influential horror films of all time, or conversely, like lists of influential horror films that not that many people have seen, like they're very underrated or underseen or whatever. Now, um, I will admit that this movie is a lot less, I guess, straightforward and a lot more experimental than many of the sort of more iconic universal horror films that came out around the same era, like in the 1930s, that hor most horror fans will be familiar with. There is something that's actually really kind of nightmarish about this particular movie. It has a very bizarre sort of like disjointed narrative and these really creepy surreal visuals and it really just kind of has like a whole unsettling mood to it even though um, I'm going to admit that it's not always entirely clear what exactly is going on. And I actually had to go read the Wikipedia plot synopsis to make sure that I got all the shit because I was just kind of like, wait, what does that mean that like, you know what I mean? So it's a little bit like that. So this was directed by the Danish auteur, Carl Theodore Dreyer, uh, who at the time that this was made was already kind of like, you know, very famous, very celebrated for his 1928 classic film, The Passion of Joan of Arc, which some people have called Called one of the greatest movies of all time. Um, but the thing about Vampire was it had a really complicated and troubled production history, which is actually like to me, I found like um, just as interesting as the movie itself. So Dreyer and his writer collaborator, uh, whose name was uh, Kristen Jewell or Yule, they wrote the script and it was based on two novellas by Sheridan Le Fanu. And it was two novellas that turned up in his 1872 collection, which was called In a Glass Darkly, which actually had five stories in it, like three short stories and two novellas. So one of the novellas that this was based on was the famous lesbian vampire story, uh, Carmilla, which obviously is a classic and has been made into movies a bunch of times. And the other one, was more like a mystery that was called The Room in the Dragon Volant, uh, which was kind of centered around a premature burial. So he wanted to do something with vampires and also with premature burial, like I said. So those two stories, they kind of took elements of those and kind of like wove a narrative around it. So I guess Dreyer wanted to make a vampire movie in particular because the 1927 stage production of Dracula had been, you know, so wildly successful. And so vampires were kind of consequently a hot commodity, like in entertainment at the time. So he started working on what would become vampire in 1929 and it was going to be his first movie with sound though because it was his first movie with sound he wasn't really all that confident in his ability to successfully make the transition from silent film so kind of to compromise on that vampire is largely silent anyway. It's kind of like it does have some dialogue in it, but not very much, so it might as well be a silent film. The people barely talk, like they do kind of say stuff and there are sound effects and things like that, but it even has like the title cards, like explaining what's going on, like a silent film would have. And it is, for all intents and purposes, it might as well be a silent film because there's really not much dialogue in it. Now the actors uh, actually mouthed the minimal dialogue in three different languages, English, French, and German. And then they were going to dub like with other voice actors, like in post-production, so they could release it on different continents. But it doesn't appear, as far as I'm aware, that the English language version version was ever finished or it was lost or something like that. The print that I actually ended up watching, which was on HBO Max, and that was like the Criterion Collection version, uh, was actually in German with English subtitles and English title cards. Like every time writing appears on the screen, it's in English. But apparently the, I don't know if they never did like an English dubbed version, but this was the German one. So I'm not really sure if the English language one is available. It just had English subtitles. This movie also has a cast of almost entirely non-actors. Some of them were just like spotted on like in a cafe or on a train or something like that. And they were like, hey, you look kind of like the character that we're looking for. So, hey, want to be in a movie? So there's that. 
Now, the main character, sort of, uh, who is this traveler guy, like, by the name of Alan Gray, that's his character's name in the movie, is actually played by a very wealthy French socialite and magazine editor whose name was Nicolas de Gunsberg, and he was actually credited in the movie under a pseudonym, Julian West, because he didn't want to embarrass his prominent family, who were really not jazzed about him wanting to be an actor. So, Carl Dreyer, it seems, uh, was a lot less less concerned about narrative cohesion, let's say that, and he was kind of more into just he wanted to do something different, something that nobody was doing. He wanted to like break new ground in cinema as a medium. So in this particular movie, he uses kind of a lot of really cool visual tricks. Like he shot some of the outdoor scenes, like everything shot on location uh, instead of on a sound stage, which was a little bit unusual for the time, I feel like. And he even shot a lot of the outdoor scenes like through a piece of gauze, like to give it this kind of blurred otherworldly look, which actually kind of happened by accident. Like when they were doing some of the dailies, I guess, and he saw them and it was kind of all like fuzzy and overexposed. And he's like, well, that's the look that I want. So then they figured out like to put gods in front of the camera, like to get that, to replicate that. Um, he also, and I kind of, I'm not like an expert of movies from this era, but I feel like a lot of movies from this era were very much like stage plays, which isn't surprising because that's, they were kind of making the transition. So, you know, they were basically just filming plays. So the camera to a large extent kind of like stayed static, like stayed still while the action was going on in front of it. But this one has kind of like some really interesting, like quick panning shots and stuff like that, which I don't believe I've ever seen. Like I said, I'm not an expert and I haven't seen a fuck ton of movies from the late 1920s, early 1930s, but I don't remember a lot of them having these kind of like sweeping panning shots like this one does. Um, he also plays a lot in this one with like uh, weird things with like shadows and double exposures and things like the ghosts and that kind of stuff. So he was kind of like pulling out all the stops to make this look different to what everyone else was doing at the time. So the movie was actually finished in 1931, but it got delayed. The release of it was delayed for nine months because Universal wanted their Dracula and Frankenstein to come out first. Whether this was a factor in the way that Vampire was generally received uh, isn't really all that clear. But what is very clear is that the critics and the audiences did not respond very favorably to Vampire, to say the very least. One reviewer, matter of fact, called it one of the worst films I have ever attended. And very famously at one showing, members of the audience demanded their money back and then started a riot when they didn't get it. So... This was very, very unsuccessful and was also a financial failure. And matter of fact, the whole uh, chaos surrounding this and the whole um, reaction to it being so negative actually made uh, Carl Dreyer have a nervous breakdown and he had to be hospitalized for a little while, like after this movie came out. I mean, obviously though, at this stage, Vampire has been, you know, has been given a critical reassessment and is now recognized for the influential classic that it is. I will say that like watching it is a lot like watching a really long, bad dream. And Although I didn't find this quite as impactful or as eerie as something like Nosferatu, for example, it still does have like a really spooky kind of like hypnotic power to it. Um, although I will say that even by 1930s standards, it's very, very slowly paced. It's not long, it's only 73 minutes, but it does like take a while, like some of the scenes are really long. So just know that going in, if, even if you're really into 1930s cinema, this might seem a little, uh, the pace might seem a little stately, you know what I mean? So as I mentioned, our main protagonist is a guy named Alan Gray, who is a traveler, they just kind of call him a traveler, and he has an interest, specifically says the title card, in devil worship and vampires. So he goes to this small French town called Cortempierre, which is a real place, and he books a night at an inn, but shortly after going to bed, even though it's like the daytime, but see, the whole thing takes place in the daytime, even though like when they're talking, like it's supposed to be night, but I guess that's because obviously they couldn't really shoot at night back then, but I don't know. It, it Again, it gives it like this really weird, like disembodied, like <laughs> kind of displaced sort of feeling to it. So he goes to bed and not long after that, like this strange old dude just kind of comes into his room, just kind of like looking at him and he just like walks in the room and 
like he sits in bed like what the fuck is this like looking all shocked and everything and he just kind of like it's very very unsettling so he comes in and he leaves this little package like a little rectangular package on the desk and then he writes on it to be opened upon my death and then he leaves and like the only thing that he says to alan is she mustn't die do you understand so this whole thing, this was a great setup. And this got me into the story like right away because I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Like I knew it was going to involve vampires, you know what I mean? In some way. But I just thought this was like a really good suspenseful setup. So then there's this kind of like long dreamlike sequence where Alan, he kind of first sees this old woman and this old man who kind of looks like Albert Einstein wandering around. And they actually will, you don't know who they are at first, but they end up factoring into the plot later on. And then he's evidently led to this manor house by a bunch of shadows, but they're like, they're supposed to be beings, I guess, but they're like weird disembodied like shadow people, but some of them are doing like regular shit. Like there's a party and there's like a bunch of couples dancing, like shadows like against the wall. Then like some of them are like sitting on benches next to each other, like they just came from work or something. And then there's one guy who's like digging a grave, but it's happening like in reverse. So like he's going like that and like the dirt is, it's, I don't know, it's like really, really weird looking. So he just sees all this kind of stuff. And I guess, I didn't get this at the time, but like after I read a synopsis, they're like, yeah, these shadows are like leading him toward this particular manor house, like where he's supposed to go. I didn't really get that, but like I said, this, you know, it's not like super, super clear what's going on. So when he gets to this manor house, he sees the old man who came in his room and left the package. But as Alan is kind of like knocking on the door, like looking in the window, like, hey, it's that guy. There's like a shadow person that's like he sees against the window or against the wall. And he has like a rifle and he shoots the old man. So alarm, like, you know, Alan is very alarmed and he runs into the house to help the guy. But it's too late. Like the dude just like dies there on the floor. So the servants ask Alan to stay there, so he does, and he finds out that the dead old guy, who's like the lord of the manor, I guess, I think that's the only name they give him, uh, frankly. So he has a daughter uh, named Leonie, and she's sick. So because it's a vampire movie, uh, you know what that means. And I think they actually do make a comment about like the wounds are healing or the wounds on her neck or something like that. So you know that like there's some vampire shenanigans going on. So because the old guy is dead and put the message on the package, oh, open it on my death, he's like, oh, well, score, I guess I can open this now. So he opens the package and it's a book about vampires and he reads it and like some of the servants read it at some points too. And like, so they'll put like pages of the book like up on the screen, like for very, very long periods of time. So like you can read it, but it's like way longer than a normal person would like need to read it. Cause I'm like, holy crap, they must've read really slow back then. I was like, I read it six times, like in the time that it was on the screen but you know what i mean now most of this stuff that's in the book like is pretty standard vampire stuff but i will admit there was some lore in there that i hadn't really heard before such as and i thought this was kind of cool this doesn't really factor into the story too much i don't think but there was a thing where um the ghosts of executed criminals would be like vampire henchmen and i was like oh that's kind of neat i never like saw anything from that angle and i thought that would kind of be a good story on its own and then there was another thing about vampires like coaxing their victims into committing suicide so that they would like turn undead quicker which totally makes sense and i don't really know why i never heard that specific piece of lore before and this part does actually factor into the story later on sort of so alan actually agrees to a blood transfusion because like the servants are like you know hey can you help her out oh and um leonie also has like a younger sister named giselle and they're like hey she needs a blood transfusion so he's like okay i'll help out so he gives a blood blood transfusion and he's also thinking of like her dead dad like coming in and leaving him the book and saying don't let her die you know what i mean so he's like okay well i'm gonna help out but in the course of staying in the house with the family and the servants, there's kind of like, like I said, she has a sister. Leonie has a sister too, Giselle, who's younger. But there's kind of like a creepy scene where, and I think that um, stills from it are even like on some prints of the, uh, you know, some DVDs or some posters or whatever, where the older sister, Leonie, she's like looking at her at her younger sister Giselle like she wants to suck her blood you know what I mean like she looks all bloodthirsty and like the face that she's making is like really really creepy so there's that but while he's staying there Alan actually starts to suspect that the Albert Einstein looking dude who is actually the village doctor and I think that's the only name they ever give him he's just village doctor like in the credits they he starts to think that he's up to some shady ass business and is actually trying to poison Leone 
uh, presumably either because he's the vampire himself and is like, hey, die so you can be a vampire with me, or is working for whoever is the actual vampire. So it turns out, uh, and spoiler alert for a movie that's nine decades old, you guys, uh, to be the latter thing. So the real vampire is actually the old woman that Alan saw earlier, like, you know, kind of out of context, and her name turns out to be Marguerite Chopin. Now, in the course of this sort of oddly stilted and fractured struggle against the villains, uh, Giselle actually ends up getting kidnapped by the doctor at some point and like tied up somewhere. And Alan has this sort of weird, there's this weird sequence. It's like he has like an out of body experience where he sees himself buried alive, like by the doctor and Marguerite, like they're putting him in a coffin and stuff. I think this whole sequence right here was like my favorite in the whole movie because like it cuts back and forth to Alan's like kind of wide eyed. He has a great face, by the way. He looks a little bit like H.P. Lovecraft now that I'm thinking about it, but he has like these big, big eyes, you know what I mean? So he has like these, he, his dead face is like in this peering through the glass window on top of his coffin. And so it cuts back and forth from that to the perspective that he would see, like if he was laying in the coffin, like being carried out of the church and like to the graveyard. So he's like seeing everything from below. Like he can see the sky and like the tops of the trees and he can see like the doctor, like leaning over him and like putting the nails in and shit like that. And it's really good. It's like really, really well done. Um, and it's kind of like filmed through this little kind of small aperture. So it looks like you're looking out like through the top of the coffin. And I thought that was like really cool. And it goes on for a while, but it, and I was it, not entirely sure. I'm like, wait, is this really happening? Happening, or is he just like having a dream? But it's like he's having like a dream or a premonition or something like that, but it's really, really effective. So everything gets sorted out in the end. Um, Alan wakes up from his weird like daydream and ends up helping a servant like stake Marguerite with an iron bar. Like they crack open her big like gravestone and like put an iron bar through her chest. Uh, Giselle gets, who got kidnapped earlier, she gets found and she gets rescued. And the ghost of the old guy who got shot earlier, the one that left the book and everything, Thing. he kind of um yeah like when his ghost appears it's like this big face like in the window which actually looks really cool i thought it was like really really uh creepily done and actually his ghost somehow like disembodiedly like kills one of the other henchmen like there was this soldier that was working with them too and he just like kills him and he's all fucked up on the stairs and then also like chases the albert einstein looking doctor guy out of the house so like the doctor ends up running to this mill and uh, the hero servant, I think it's the same servant that like staked the vampire, locks the doctor like in this little chamber and then like opens up the, the thing and like all the flower falls on him and like suffocates him. Now, apparently this wasn't the original ending. They were gonna have the doctor like either like, I think he was supposed to drown in a swamp in the original version of the script. But then when they were scouting locations and they saw this mill and they were kind of like, oh my God, that mill's awesome. We like, <laughs> we need to do something with that. So they decided to like suffocate him in the flower just so they could use the mill in the movie. But there is like a little bit of a thing at the end, like after Alan and, um, and Giselle like get away and they kind of like get in a boat and whatnot. But yeah, they kind of, but I like the flower thing better. It's just kind of like more horrific. I think that in the German version of the film, they actually kind of cut that because they they thought it was too scary which like i said nowadays it's like not it's nothing but back then they were probably probably like freaking out like somebody being suffocated by a bunch of flour which is kind of like a horrible death if you think about it so i mean if you have any interest at all in the foundations of horror cinema this is definitely one that you probably should see like before you die not gonna lie as i mentioned earlier it's very very slow it's not a long movie it's only 73 minutes and i will say too that a lot of times you don't really have a solid handle on what's happening because it's kind of like surreal like i said the whole sequence with him seeing all the shadow people i didn't really get that the shadow people were leading him to this house where he was supposed to go like he was fated to do that and i only got that like later after i was like reading other like synopsis of it instead of like oh okay that makes sense but it wasn't like super clear in the course of the movie some of the things are but you know not so much other things but i will say like the visuals are really really creepy really effective and like i said sort of surreal and the movie kind of has this real good like just 
this whole mood of unease that's like permeating the proceedings even when even when not much is really going on it was actually like a fascinating experiment for the time for sure and it's really an intriguing contrast to the more you know the less ambiguous and maybe more crowd pleasing like universal monster movies that more people are familiar with so if you're into experimental cinema or you know silent film or anything like that because like i said this isn't technically a silent film but it might as well be because there's only there's just a handful of uh, lines of dialogue in it and most of the rest of it is set up like a silent film. But if you're at all interested in that and you haven't seen this, then it's probably one that you should, uh, you know, kind of put on your list to see before you die because it's kind of an important film in the history of horror cinema. So that will do it for this movie retrospective. Hope you enjoyed it and I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye.